think we're going to go right on with the rest of our session. Dan Lieberman will chair the session. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, I just want to add my thanks uh, to all the organizers, especially to bring us here to Arizona. Uh, those of us, you, you come from the Northeast, know uh, what a relief it is to be in this climate. I, I, this morning was the first time I got to go for a run and didn't have to dodge ice sheets and, and wear tights, and it was just great. So, um, so this session is uh, on the public understanding of science and, um, and on medical education. And um, I think it's fitting that our first uh, speaker is Marlene Zook, who, uh, from the University of Michigan. And if you um, haven't read her book, Paleo Fantasy. Minnesota. University of Minnesota, did Indeed, I say? You did. I'm sorry. It's OK. It was a long time ago. Apologies. That's all I right. I actually know that you're from University of Minnesota. But I want to say that right. many of you may have experienced the phenomenon that when somebody asks you about evolutionary medicine, the first thing they think about that is the paleo diet. That's what evolutionary medicine is. And Marlene, I think, did us all a favor with her delightful, wonderful book, um, helping um, um, apply a critical eye to, uh, to, that, uh, to that way of thinking, anyway. Thanks. Um, and so that's a great entree because that's exactly what I do want to talk about today. You know, when people think about how we apply evolution to medicine, they think about two kinds of things. Um, the first one is that, and, and there's a core of truth to both of them, and, and I'm going to explore that and talk about the way that people sometimes misunderstand what we're trying to do. The first one um, is that there's this mismatch between um, our current environment that we're living in, modern, industrial, um, industrialized, Western, uh, with Western medicine, um, and the environment in which we evolved, and that because of that mismatch, um, we're suffering from a lot of diseases. And the way a lot of people will put this um, is that you know uh, we have a new environment, but we're still carrying around the same genes we had, and so this mismatch is what leads us um, to disease. And so because of that, lots of people want to and, and, and you can kind of you can understand this at, at its core. Want to go back to what they see as a more natural state that's where we were quote unquote you know meant to be. And so I've been bombarded recently. Maybe some of you have too um, by emails from uh, a guy who's um, promoting what he calls the chimp diet um, with chimp food. So this is not the paleo diet. Instead, we're all supposed to be eating like chimpanzees. Um, and uh, so this is I think he wants me to invest in his company. Actually, is where this comes from. Um, but so this is just some quotes from some of his emails that is all about um, eating a natural diet in hopes of living an illness-free and disease-free life like the other one million species of animals in nature who live virtually free of all illness and disease. Um, and that chimp food was created to mimic the healthy diet of our closest living relatives, chimpanzees, who are almost 99% like us. However, they live virtually disease-free. Um, just imagine, no, I know there are primatologists in the audience. Um, just imagine no obesity, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, arthritis, headaches, ADD. I don't know how you tell if a chimp has ADD. Um, de depression and thousands of other diseases. Okay, so obviously everybody's chuckling at this and you know, we realize that there's a lot that's problematic about it to say the least. But I, one thing I always pick out is that, um, so there's lots more than one million species of animals. So like why would, um, so what about the other, like besides the one million species of animals who presumably live virtually free, what about the rest of them? Like are there lots and lots of sick you know, nematodes and uh, you know, other sorts of animals that, that are without this benefit that he proclaims? Anyway, I, you know, I'm not gonna dwell on this because I'm sure we could all find what's wrong with it. But I think that it really does come from some assumptions that people make when they hear about the, the concept that evolution influences how healthy we are. And the first one is that humans are going to be best suited to the environment of our ancestors, so an environment like that of hunter-gatherers. And second, and correlated with this, is the idea that, well, you know, the reason we're in all this trouble is that evolution doesn't happen quickly enough for us to have adapted to the way life is now. And that's back to this old um, genes in a new environment idea. So what I want to do is, in effect, give some of us some ammunition to deal with these misconceptions by re-examining them. All right. So obviously, there, there is a kernel of truth to this. We know that there are diseases that arose since the advent of agriculture, for example. Um, shared water sources that people have when they're settled down lead to the transmission of diseases that you simply don't risk when you're living a more nomadic lifestyle. Similarly, simply having a larger population, which comes with agriculture and the ability to support bigger groups of people, is going to lead to diseases like measles that require a reservoir of more people than were 
uh, likely to have occurred um, uh, further back in our history. So, you know, yes, there are definitely diseases that came with, um, with modernity. Um, we also know that there are so-called diseases of civilization or diseases of affluence that have already been um, mentioned uh, earlier today. Um, there's, there's an obesity epidemic, um, diabetes has skyrocketed just over the last few decades, um, rates of hypertension and uh, cardiovascular diseases. So there's all of these autoimmune diseases, there's all of these ailments that we recognize are happening now. And it, you know, at first glance, it seems reasonable to figure that if we can just get back to the way we evolved, we're going to be better off. Oh, and I found out that there's actually a band called Modern Diseases, so, you know, hey. Um, all right, but the point is that, as I'm sure all of us know here, diseases have always been with us. And I think this is something that maybe we underemphasize when we talk to either non-scientists or even to people from other disciplines that genetic defects and infectious diseases have always been present in humans as indeed they are in other animals. And this was brought home, I think, in a beautiful paper several years ago that just did a survey of um, a, a database that's now available that has more than 4,000 chromosomal regions associated with genetic diseases, which, which is, I, I love this name, it's called Morbid Map. Um, which I think is really charming. Um, and the people that did the survey found that a lot, in fact, a majority of the disease-related genes can be traced back far, far beyond even, even the existence of humans. And we share a lot of genetic uh, dis disorders with other species, as Barbara's talk this morning, of course, underscored. In addition to that, the idea that, oh, well, you know, we've just got these genes we had before and we're not able to change them is also not well founded. Um, so our genome has lots of genes that are associated with fighting disease, many of which arose quite recently. And there's been some interesting study of the CCR5 Delta gene, which spread across Europe and Western Asia only about a thousand years ago, so far as people can determine, which is relatively recent, of course, from an evolutionary perspective. And at first it was thought that this arose um, as it provided protection against bubonic plague. Now the evidence looks like it's falling more in line with protection against smallpox. Um, and currently there's a great deal of interest because uh, there's the potential for uh, the same uh, gene or a variant of it to provide some uh, immunity to HIV and AIDS. But the point is that this gene changed the human, th this has changed in the human genome as little as a thousand years ago. Um, tuberculosis, I won't spend much time on this because we had a great talk on this earlier um, from uh, Ann Stone. Uh, again, the conventional wisdom was this was a zoonotic disease which humans developed only after animal domestication, so in a way it was a disease of civilization. Newer evidence, though, as we heard, suggests that it evolved a lot earlier. Actually, a paper that I found um, suggested that it's, uh, it's quite ancient, um, as much as 2.6 to 2.8 million years ago. And of course, the resistance genes to tuberculosis are still evolving. So this idea that all of the diseases that we're plagued with are things that our ancestors didn't have to worry about are just not true. Um, cancer is probably the, the poster child example of this. Lots and lots and lots of people are very firmly convinced that cancer is a scourge of civilization, um, that it uh, is because of our modern diet, modern lifestyle, um, and people talk a lot about the role of toxins, which I put in quotes here because, of course, no one really knows what those are. Um, well, you can examine ancient remains to look at evidence of cancer. Um, finding evidence in the bone of cancer that's metastasized to, to the skeleton, and then if you can find the parts of the skeleton that contain those remains, you can extrapolate to um, proportions of people that died of cancer. In addition to that, people have looked for evidence of cancer in contemporary hunter-gatherer societies. And this was done um, a few years ago. There was a paper in Nature Reviews Cancer that surveyed um, cancer in ancient people and both looking at surveys in the literature and in mummified remains, and they detected very, very few instances, which was picked up on, I'm sure a lot of you remember the hype on this, it was picked up on by the media. This is just one of the headlines. Um, so they concluded cancer was, quote, rare in antiquity, um, and media, you know, cancer caused by modern man as it was virtually non-existent in the ancient world. Um, this is from the Telegraph, cancer is a modern man-made disease caused by the excesses of modern life. And I think this resonated with a lot of people. 
But was it really actually so rare? Of course, there's a big detection problem here. Because how do we calculate from either ancient records, which of course are incomplete, but even from ancient remains, the proportion of people who died of cancer that we would have expected to see. And uh, Tony Waldron calculated or came up with a formula that takes into account the expected number of people who would have died of cancer, what their skeletons would have looked like, um, how our likelihood would have been of detecting that in the skeleton and so forth. He discounted tobacco-related cancers because obviously those are modern. Um, and both in a study that he did and in an independent one um, uh, several years later, the rates actually weren't all that different than what you expected, um, both from looking at ancient Egyptians, from Europeans uh, from 14 to 1800, they found about as many remains showing signs of having died of cancer as you would think would, uh, you, you would see. So cancer may not be that modern scourge after all. All right, so where I think this is all coming from, and, and this is, I, I was telling somebody last night that I, I wanted to sort of explain where I think people are going off the rails with this, is I think that people really have trouble understanding that evolution is a continuous process. Okay, that, you know, they have this idealized view, um, which I refer to in my book as a paleo fantasy, um, although that's not my, I didn't come up with that term, it's from Leslie Aiello, um, that, you know, back in the day, and, you know, pick the day, we were in perfect harmony with our environment, and we were evolving along and evolving along, and we got perfectly adapted, and then, you know, stuff happened, often people point to the advent of agriculture, and we, you know, everything just went to hell in a handbasket because we just weren't adapted for it, evolution was happening, uh, or evolution can't happen quickly enough because we were changing very fast. But of course, that's not how evolution works. You know, you could easily say, well, did we feel uneasy when, you know, scavenging was the rule and then people started hunting? Did someone say, hold on a minute, we're perfectly adapted to scavenging, do not pick up that spear? I mean, this, obviously that would be ludicrous, but it's just as ludicrous to think that evolution would halt for us um, now. And of course, maybe we should just want to be aquatic because, you know, life arose in the sea. And we have lots of adaptations that suggest that we're really not fully on board with this whole terrestrial existence. And so I think what's really the problem is a lot of these cartoons, and I know we've all seen tons of them. They're very popular um, when people talk about how evolution works, and they often idealize, you know, something that happened a long time ago. You've got, you know, sort of the bent over uh, ape-like ancestor, and then it's always a guy with a spear or some other weapon, um, which is a whole other sociological thing. Um, and so what's wrong with those cartoons? Well. First of all, and this is an aside, but I have to mention it, they almost never show women. It's like women don't evolve, the men evolve, and then the women like kind of wait for them and then like, oh yes, we can go catch up, which is a little weird. Um, but more problematic, or at least more germane to my purpose here, um, they assume that there's a straight line evolution with one form that's replaced by a better form, and then eventually you get to the best form, which in most people's ideas was that, you know, we have people. So people are kind of the pinnacle of evolution. But of course, that's not true. And I think that what we need to do is disabuse people of this notion that evolution is somehow a march of progress and that we have a ladder with people at the top and all other organisms, including earlier forms of ourselves, somehow at the bottom and that we were evolving to get here and we need to be careful we don't tumble off. So I really think we need to be careful when we talk to people about those ideas about mismatch and avoid oversimplifying what we mean. Evolution, of course, can actually happen very quickly, particularly for disease-related genes, and it's still going on right now. And finally, and most, you know, foremost, I think when we talk to people about this, that we want to emphasize that evolution doesn't have any goal that it's trying to achieve. Thank you.